Hi there. My name is uh, Emily. Um, that's me, yes, looking very surprised. I manage the engineering team at Honeycomb. Um, before I get too far into this, I just want to say that uh, if you go to the schedule for Olicon, um, there is a, a link to any blog post or resources that I talk about at the, the bottom of my talk. So uh, you know, if you see a blog post URL on screen or if I show some code, you don't have to copy it down right there. Uh, it'll all be linked to you after the talk. And if I forget, you know, just poke me and I'll, I'll add it. Oh, yeah, there's the link. Um, I have worked as an engineer at lots of different companies, and I've worked all over the stack, but my favorite thing has always been browser JavaScript development, so front-end development. Um, and I found that front-end development doesn't always get the respect that it deserves, especially when I was getting started in kind of the early to mid-2000s, which, of course, meant that I had to make strategic alliances with everyone on the ops team. That's right. Yep, this was good. We had a lot in common. Uh, we were both underappreciated. We both loved to blame it on the network. And of course, you know, we both had to work with back-end developers. Yeah, no, that's, that's not fair. Sometimes they're really wonderful, you know. Uh, anyway, um, we had in common that we love to nerd out about graphs and alerts and monitoring. Uh, and we both, in our own ways, understood production really well. Um, the folks who ran our infrastructure, of course, understood production because they had to keep those systems running. And front-end developers have this way where they understand production because their code is so close to the users. Uh, it's the one way that the users tend to interact with our systems. Um, and we have to understand how our code is really working in production to know whether or not we're doing a good job. So when I heard Charity say this, nines don't matter if users aren't happy, my head kind of exploded because it was like these two worlds that I really care about kind of coming together. And it reminded me that. Uh, whether we're working on infrastructure or, or back-end code or front-end JavaScript, we all really have the same goal, which is that we want to make our business successful by delivering a great experience to our customers. And of course, you know, as an engineer, like, I love to pride myself on the cool technical solutions that I have come up with to things, but those technical accomplishments don't really matter if fundamentally our users aren't happy and they're not having a good experience with our app. But that leads to another question. How do we actually know if our users are happy? Um, you know, we can wait for them to email us and be like, ah, your site's broken, or I didn't like this. But, you know, a very small percentage of users will actually do that. Can we take our existing observability toolkit that we use to understand our systems and kind of turn the telescope around the other way and use it to look at our users, too? Um, I think we can. I think we can understand them a lot better using that toolkit than by some of the other means that we might try to do. So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, first, I have a, a short story to talk about why we should do this, why we should be instrumenting in the browser, so directly in the client. Um, then I'm going to kind of dig into how we actually set up our instrumentation at Honeycomb, kind of talk through the nuts and bolts of that. Um, after that, I will tell you a story of how we actually use our observability toolkit not just to fix problems, but also to kind of look forward into the future and, and think about design and, and how we you know, make new, new products and features in the future. And then um, this is the part I'm most psyched about. Uh, Rachel Fong is going to jump back on stage. Uh, she's another engineer at Honeycomb, and she's going to talk a little bit about how she's using some of these techniques in her work, too. Uh, and I love this not just because it's a great story, but because so many companies have one weird person in the corner who works on this kind of stuff, who does it by themselves. And I've like, finally convinced someone else to care about this. And Honeycomb is a company where like, lots of people think about instrumenting the client. I just think it's so awesome. So I'm really excited to share that. And then finally, I'm just going to say a few words about why I think right now is the time to be doing this if you, if you haven't started yet. So first, I want to tell you a little story uh, about something we ran into when we were building Honeycomb, the product. Um, and this is a story that I think really explains why client-side instrumentation running in the browser is important. Um, Chris Toshak, who is on my team, worked on this. Yeah, come on. Don't, don't just sit there. There you go. There's Chris. Um, so, to kind of tee this up a little bit, uh, part of the value proposition of Honeycomb is that uh, we really want queries to be fast. Um, we want you to be able to iteratively explore your data, and so this means being able to ask a question, get an answer, ask a question, get an answer, have that loop be relatively speedy. And uh, you know, when we can look at our query engine uh, performance, we go, yeah, like it's really fast. Like the, the vast majority of queries are under one second. And uh, you know, we felt really awesome about that. But we heard some gripes from users that they felt like the in-browser experience was a little slow. And of course, when I actually say users, I mostly mean Honeycomb employees, because they're often some of our toughest customers. That's right. <laughs> so you know, we started to dig into the numbers. 
Uh, and we could see that uh, the time to render a graph on screen took a lot longer than we'd like. It was often multiple seconds. And we thought, OK, like, that doesn't seem very good. Let's pick a target, see if we can hit it. Um, so you know, just pick an ambitious target. Let's say one second. Great, very ambitious. So we had lots of great ideas as engineers for how to make this interaction faster. Um, the query loading strategy uses polling. So you know, we were nerding out about like, faster ways to do polling, like maybe we can use web sockets, like maybe we can use server push. Uh, but then we started actually looking at the data to see what we were doing. And it turns out that we had the poll interval set to one second. So there's our target right there, right? The target is already shot. Um, you send your query request. The browser waits one second, and then you know, if the result is ready, it pulls back this ball of JSON, processes it, and draws it into a graph. So you already have one second and a little bit of overhead right there. So we knew it should be shorter than that. But the question is, how much shorter? We don't want to just like hammer our query engine and go, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? You know, that's not going to help us. Um, luckily, we had instrumented things so that we could see how long it should take. So uh, this is a chart of how long it takes queries to return from our, our backend query engine. The median is 400 milliseconds. And you can see that 25% of queries are actually done in about 200 milliseconds. So this is really interesting to know right here, because it means like, you know, out of the gate, we're making customers wait for an extra half second, you know, in most cases when they don't need to. So instead of launching into our you know, week-long project to make everything on the site use WebSockets, what Chris actually ended up doing was just dropping the first two poll intervals from one second to 250 milliseconds. This entire change is about 20 lines of code. And most of it is actually just adding new constants. And of course, we'd also instrumented the JavaScript app to track how many poll iterations it took to load this graph. So this is our chance to look back and go, did this work? And we found out that 90% like, of our queries actually were done now within the first poll interval. 94% uh, were done within the first two. So just by changing that timeout, all of a sudden, we had made our queries about 50% faster. Interestingly enough, you'll notice that uh, <laughs> this is a lot faster than you would think based on that prior graph. And it turns out that the React app is actually introduces about 200 to 300 milliseconds of delay just to go ask for that result and get it back. So there's a little bit of extra lag time built in there, which is kind of nice, because that means that there's some performance uh, optimization we can pick up in the future, too, if we need to. Um, if you want to dig more into the details of this, we have a great blog post on the Honeycomb blog, which I linked to from those notes. Um, but I really love this story. I love this story for two reasons. One, because I think it, it, it's my constant reminder that um, how fast your infrastructure is doesn't matter if you haven't found a way to pass that speed on to your users. And, and two, I kind of like that this story feels a little silly, right? You're like, you solved this very important user problem not with you know, a fancy new algorithm or some exotic optimization. You just took like, basic arithmetic, a five-line code change, and then the most important part was that instrumentation that helped us see what to do. But I think if most of us stop and think, is our instrumentation good enough to find these kinds of opportunities everywhere we have them in our app? Most of us, if we're being honest with ourselves, would say no. I mean, I would say that, and I spent a lot of time on this. So I want to talk about how we fix this. This is going to be the, the nitty-gritty details part where I talk about what we actually do at Honeycomb. Um, so it'll be a little bit like code on slides. I promise it won't be too long. Uh, first, I do want to say a quick word about tool choice. Um, Obviously, you know, I work at Honeycomb. I'm going to talk about building Honeycomb, so I'm going to say Honeycomb a lot. And uh, I don't want you to come away from this talk thinking that my aim is for you to use Honeycomb. I think the most important part of this is doing your own instrumentation, like instrumenting your app well and understanding how it works. Um, and I think there's a lot of different places that you could send events to be able to just ask questions to that data after the fact. Um, if you don't use Honeycomb, I think you know, some options are you can send these events to wherever you send your logs. Um, that's a really good one, because you, know, you already have all the infrastructure set up. You can work with them the same way that you're used to with your logs. Um, if you don't want to do that, there are metrics tools that support high cardinality data. That's one other option. Um, you do want to make sure you have something that will keep all that context, because the browser really has a lot of unique context that's useful for debugging. And um, finally, this is a little bit of a weird one, but if you are very constrained on tools, or if you work in an organization where you can't get access to those first two tools, um, your error monitoring tool can actually do this in a pinch. A lot of them have a data model that is very kind of event-based. And so you, uh, as long as it's something that lets you set a level and, and not just report everything as an error, if you can set info or warning, which most of the, the most popular SaaS products will let you do, then you can actually do some of the same things with that. So 
let's talk about how we instrumented our, our primary customer-facing web app. I'll talk about the back-end side of things first, because it's pretty simple, and I think it just sort of sets up the analogy for the front-end. Uh, for reasons, all of our services are named after dogs. We have a whole pack of them. Stole this diagram from Travis. Thank you, Travis. Um, our storage engine is called Retriever. Our API server is called Shepherd. The trigger service is Bassett. Uh, but I'm going to talk about how we instrumented our customer-facing web app, which is called Poodle. Yes, they named it that before I joined the company, uh, the first front-end person. And I said, why is it called Poodle? And I just looked at them, and I said, it's because poodles are strong, talented, working dogs with many skills, right? Yes. They said, right, that's right. OK. So on the server side, um, it's a Go app. The basic instrumentation strategy is pretty simple. Um, we send roughly an event to Honeycomb per request. So we generally find that it's best to make our events really wide with as much context as we can. Um, so any field that's ever been relevant to a bug or an incident should probably be included in there. Um, this screenshot is probably like half or a third of the fields we actually send, but I wanted it to fit on screen. Uh, some of the fields relate to like HTTP requests and response stuff. So typically, those are derived from headers. Um, we also have a lot of information about the environment. Uh, so a really important thing there might be like the build or the availability zone or more information about where this code is actually running. And then finally, there's a, a small number of, of some of our most important fields, which are the kind of app-specific context, so like the email of the, the currently logged in user, the ID of the currently logged in user, the team that they're currently logged into. Um, there's a lot of data there, but the, the basic model is pretty simple, which is you know uh, one request or one unit of work equals sending one event. Uh, so that was the back end. Now, if you flip over to the browser side, uh, that server data is really valuable, but my thesis is that it's not enough to be able to understand what's really happening. So how do you instrument something complicated like a browser JavaScript app? This is the Honeycomb Query Sandbox. Um, the web app portion of Honeycomb is uh, built with React, uh, SCSS, server-rendered Go templates, and a lot of data that we send to the browser is JSON. Um, we're not a full single-page app but we have some kind of complex ajax -y behavior that makes us feel a little like a single page app. For example, if you interact with a query sandbox and you run queries, we'll um, call push state to change the URL, and uh, you know, most of the page will re-render when you load a new graph result. So things can go wrong in all kinds of ways that won't manifest in our server logs or um, won't show up in our server side metrics at all. So how do we instrument this? Funny enough, the strategy doesn't actually change that much from the back end to the front end. Um, we have some of the same request-related fields. Uh, for example, uh, you can see that you know, the, the URL of the page that you're visiting is in there. Um, interestingly, a thing we really want to do in this context, we should be doing this back end and front end, but I think it's even more important on the front end, is passing in um, the um, that box. It's not in the right place. All right. Uh, passing in the A-B testing groups that you're in. So. Um, a lot of times, there can be complex interactions between like, feature flags or uh, A-B test groups. So passing those in will really help us see, is there something about this particular group that is uh, negatively impacting our users or impacting performance? We also collect all of the navigation timing metrics, so performance metrics about that page load. And then um, finally, we do a lot of work to collect information about the device that this code is running on. So um, we're going to collect the user agent to give us the browser, browser version, operating system. Um, we're also going to collect information about the hardware itself, so like what is the screen size, screen width. Um, and then a kind of cool thing that you can do is collect information about the capabilities of the browser. Like if you're thinking about using like a kind of newish browser feature and you want to understand how much of your customer base is actually ready for that, you can just query it in the browser and report the result back. Um, I know you can look at charts for this kind of thing on like can I use or MDN, but those are not always a perfect rep representation of reality, especially when browsers roll out so many different uh, like versions so quickly. Like you may actually be able to get more up-to-date data by checking it yourself. And um, I think I want to emphasize that that is just sort of scratching the surface. Um, basically, if you think about it, anything that you can query with JavaScript, you can be reporting on your events. So depending on kind of how you're thinking about designing in the future, what features you want to use, you could be checking installed fonts, uh, screen dimension, color depth, browser language, online offline status. Like This is interesting to know if your users are connected most of the time or if some of them are dealing with connection trouble. Uh, page visibility, which is to say, do, do people open your uh, window and then just like put it in a background tab, or are they looking at it engaged the whole time that they're on the site? And then connection type. So are most of my users on a, a fast connection, like fiber or like LTE, or are people using a 3G connection or a DSL? 
So remember how I said one page load equals one event? It's not quite the whole story. Um, we really want to send an event every time there is a unit of work, which is every time something interesting happens. Uh, and I think more precisely client side, that means uh, sending an event every time the user does something interesting. So when is that? I think there are five times, basically, you should be sending an event. First, on page load, that's the one we just talked about. Um, I think there's also, it's important to capture that there's an analogous version of that in single page apps. So many of us are running single page apps now. So whenever you are doing a, a push date to change the URL, or you are um, using like React Router or something like that to go to a new section of content, to your user, that's going to feel like visiting a new page. And you want to have as much data on that as you can. Like you should be tracking it just like it's a real page load. Um, we also send an event on significant user interaction. So if someone's interacting with a new or complex feature, we want to track. Um, for example, we have a feature called derived columns. And we know that they're really valuable, but we also know that they can be a little difficult to set up. So we'll send an event when someone clicks to create one, when someone starts editing the, the forms to create one, and then when they finally submit it. So we can kind of watch that funnel and see if people get stuck anywhere along the way. Um, we should send events on errors. That one kind of just intuitively makes sense. Uh, in, in our case, we probably want to send it to both an error monitoring tool and a honeycomb. And then uh, we also send an event on page unload, which is very useful for understanding what kind of happened over the course of from when the user opened that page to when they left it. So did memory usage go up? Uh, how long did they look at the page for? Any change in state between the two is kind of interesting to track with that unload event. So interestingly enough, I set up all this instrumentation, or you know, other folks on the team set it up, um, before Honeycomb supported tracing. And when I look at it now, some of these actually really jump out at me as things that should be better as part of a trace. That page unload event in particular should really be combined with that load event. You should have the two of them together. And that was just like a limitation of the tools that I didn't see until there was a better version available. So if I went back and redid this today, I would definitely set up load and unload as traces, and then put some of those significant user interactions into that trace. Uh, so that you could kind of picture that, that the entire experience of viewing that page together. Um, as much as we could, or as much as we can, we should also be thinking about sending performance data along with our events. Um, if they describe a unit of work or an interesting user interaction, we should also be able to ask ourselves, was this a fast or slow interaction? Um, I think sometimes it's a little hard to know exactly what you should be measuring in terms of performance. So I really like the rail performance model from Google. Um, Rail focuses on four different types of performance, and Google has kind of suggested targets for each of these that they think are the kind of the point that will feel reasonable or feel fast to your users. Um, responses for input latency. So, for example, if someone clicks a button or they start typing in a form field, uh, the UI should change in response within 100 milliseconds, even if it's just to do something simple like show a spinner. For animations, this one kind of makes more intuitive sense. Animations should run at 60 frames per second. That's how they'll look smooth. Um, idle is all about making sure that that main thread is available when you need it. Like JavaScript is single threaded. So if you're running a bunch of work in the background, you need to be breaking it up into chunks small enough that if the user goes and clicks on something, they don't have to wait for that to finish. So I think you should be able to return control uh, to, to the main thread in like 20 milliseconds. And finally, load is the one that I think most of us track pretty well already. So this is being able to understand how fast resources uh, can be downloaded to the browser and measured on screen. Um, Honeycomb's instrumentation right now really focuses on primarily on load and response. But as we uh, have more and more complex interactions, we'll probably focus in a little more on the other two. So once you wire these all up, I'm, we're running a little short on time, so I will kind of super quickly run through these. I, I think you'll start to find more and more states that are not quite errors, but they are error-like, and they're interesting to instrument in addition to kind of your basic instrumentation that I was just talking about. Um, one of my favorite ones is refresh tracking. I think a lot of single page apps, it's possible to get yourself into very complex states that are hard to reproduce. And so sometimes you get to a point where you just sort of look at the screen and you're like, is this broken? Or like, do I trust this data on screen? And I think most of us have learned as a coping mechanism to just try refreshing the page. So it's actually really interesting to track when users press Command R or Control R, um, because that's kind of that cue to tell you this is a point when the user doesn't trust your app. So, uh, we don't actually do this at Honeycomb yet, but on past sites, I found that the most common pages are, are graphs, obviously, because they tend to be pretty complex. And people often want to like refresh to see if they'll load new data. But uh, 
The surprising one that uh, I've seen more than once that I didn't expect at all was settings pages are really popular for this. It's often if you have a list of, of users, like if you have a team page where you can do invites, it's very common for people to refresh those. And the case there is people are inviting a teammate. They want to see if that person got in. So they're just sort of sitting there refreshing the page to be like, did this person get in? Can they use the app yet? And uh, we could probably really help them out by just having that page live update. Um, another thing that's kind of in the same vein is, is rage click tracking, which I think you probably will kind of intuitively know what it is if you have used a JavaScript web app. Um, this is, you know, you get into that situation where you click a button, it doesn't do what you want it to, you try it again, and then you're like, it's still not doing it, and then you're like, click, 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 click. I'm going to fix this just by like hitting my mouse really hard. Um, this is a good thing to know about because it means your users are very unhappy, right? Um, so in this case, what you want to do is, is have a little bit of JavaScript that detects clicks on the same target that are you know, more than two clicks, like less than you know, 300 milliseconds apart. And then in the event, you want to record the, the selector that's the target so you can kind of look at where in your UI is triggering these clicks. I think this is a really useful one if you're still kind of figuring out your UI design patterns and you're not sure if um, people are, are able to make sense of, of how your app works. So I think it's pretty intuitively clear how you can use this kind of instrumentation to find things that are broken and help yourself debug and solve problems. But another great thing that we do with it is use it to kind of look ahead and think about what should we build in the future? How should we make this work? So I want to tell you a short story about that. We had oh, people, are, people are like, why are you showing these old UI screenshots? I'm like, I want you to know how far it's come. Um, we had this sidebar for a long time. Um, it shows the history of every query that you've ever run in Honeycomb. That's still true. It just looks a little different now. Really neat feature, but we found that users didn't always understand what we were showing and didn't always have the desire to go digging through it to find things. So our designer started thinking about how to make it better. Um, and he kind of wondered how to change it. Like, would users rather just see larger graphs? Um, user research is definitely like the gold standard of, of how you solve this. You know, go in, talk to a bunch of users, see what they need, watch them use the app. Um, but you know, that, that can take a long time. You don't necessarily want to apply that whole toolkit to every problem when you're an early company. So um, we kind of looked at our data and said, is there anything that our data can tell us about this problem? One piece of, oh, that's a sidebar. One piece of data we were already capturing was window heights and widths, and then screen heights and widths. So this is a heat map of um, users' window heights, their widths, and then those two multiplied together, so the total number of pixels on screen. And we did the same thing for screen size. And then, of course, if you take those two things together, um, you can get the percentage of the screen that's taken up by the current window. So that's this heat map. And you can kind of see that there's that almost like horizontal line right there. There's kind of that dense clustering right at like 90%. Um, and, and the median value is actually over 85%. And you know, sort of digging a little more into this, I was like, why is there that line there? It turns out that browser and operating system Chrome tends to be about 5 to 8% of the page on, on most people's uh, uh, you know, like desktop or laptop computers. So what this is telling us is that most of our users are making their windows pretty large already to view the graphs. It's not like they have a lot of extra space that they can use. Um, so this is useful by itself, but it's also really great to be able to slice across this uh, and be able to kind of look at arbitrary slices of data. So if you, if you break this down by page, you can actually see something even more interesting, which is that on that page we were looking at with the graphs, uh, the average screen size is or window size is actually 30,000 pixels larger. So even if people were coming to us, like if it's just really common to have a large browser window, they were actually making their browser window even larger just to view that one page. So that really helps us understand, OK, users probably do want to see these graphs a little bigger. So when we thought about how to redesign this, the thumbnail is now a little bit bigger. You know, Maybe people want to just look at all the graphs a little more closely. But then this is the cool part that, that is the response to that. Um, the sidebar actually collapses now. So um, all of a sudden, that graph that you couldn't make any bigger, you can suddenly get back a little more screen real estate, look at it a little more closely. And I just really like this. I think this is a really cool design intervention that was driven by data. Um, to close the loop, you know, we should look back and go, OK, did, did this change the percentage of users who were you know, going out of their way to make their, their browser window extra large on that page? Uh, yeah, can't really tell from the data. We need to do a little more research. But I really like this kind of. Um, using data to think about where to go next. I think it's a good way of kind of checking our assumptions and making sure that we're doing things that kind of seem like they align with reality. So that was a kind of simple example. I think you can kind of move beyond that and do more complicated things to, to kind of use these observability tools to validate product work. And this is what I want to have Rachel come up and talk about. 
so hey, I'm Arfang again. I'm a platform-ish engineer at Honeycomb, and I'm just here to tell a short anecdote um, about using UX observability to make uh, platform prioritization decisions. Um, and you're going to notice me talking a lot about when to not build things. I do actually write code sometimes, but people talk about it all the time. It's uh, interesting to decide when to not build things. <laughs> Um, so here's a honeycomb screenshot. Um, at the top, you see the query builder. Query creation is pretty iterative, so I didn't build this whole query at once. I put in one thing at a time, run the query, see if that's what I wanted, uh, and then try altering it, realize I forgot to put in a filter or something, and run it again. And as you go through the process of building a query, um, there are a lot of columns to sift through, and it's pretty annoying to find out what you actually want. So I thought, it would be nice if we surfaced interesting columns. A lot of these are auto-generated. If you have more than zero coworkers, you probably didn't write all your instrumentation, so you don't know what these things do. So I thought, how can we use fun math to surface useful columns into product? And I was thinking about covariance matrices and event shape, and I showed my brainstorm doc to people, um, and someone suggested machine learning, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> that, no, <laughs> let's not do that. <laughs> Um, and then fortunately, Christine Yen came along and asked, what's your actual success metric for this project? How do you know if you succeeded? I realized I did not have one. So I asked, would adding these features actually make it easier for users to build queries? That's my goal. Um, I found out that not only did I have no idea, but no one else on the team had any idea, and there was no instrumentation to that effect. <laughs> so that was my next action item. Um, so I went into our query builder, instrumented that, and I found that people were taking an average of 27 seconds to do an individual query edit. Now that's not building the entire query again, that's just changing one or two things um, and then rerunning the query, and I take five to 10 seconds to do this, so this seemed like way too long. Uh, and because all of our app context was added in events, I was able to break down by whether someone was a honeycomber or not, and found that, as expected, honeycombers are taking less than 10 seconds to do this, and customers are taking significantly longer. Um, and so I kind of threw uh, you know, machine learning and covariance out the window, because this illustrates that we don't really need to fine tune. This is like a pretty major usability gap between people who are and aren't familiar with the product. Oops. Um, yeah, so my finding was that people who have not worked on our product are slower at using our product, which is pretty obvious in retrospect, but now at least we have a number for it and we can A-B test or something like that. Um, so I decided to look, um, instead of doing fancy platform features, we decided to prioritize really obvious features instead. For example, does this column have no data? It's probably not important. Does this column get queried very often? People might want to query it. Um, here are a few takeaways that I came away with here. Um, if you find yourself brainstorming fun changes, always step back and ask what your real success metric is. Like, how is this feature adding value for your customers? Um, number two, as a result of doing that, as, as a result of instrumenting uh, that metric, I discovered a really embarrassing usability gap that we now get to fix. Um, and three, I ended up looking at the lowest hanging high impact fruit um, because you can spend hundreds of hours building an ML pipeline to personalize results, but honestly, it probably makes way more impact to do something simple like graying out a stale column. Here's a bonus takeaway number four. Um, after I had made my own job easier, I just did this to make some platform decisions, but obviously it's really useful for product to, to know how easy a query is to build, how long people are taking, so I did a bunch of shouting about it uh, on our communication channels. That's all, back to Emily. Um, I just want to say a couple more words about why I think that like now is a really, really good time to be doing this. Um, so, an interesting thing that I've seen happening in the past, you know, five or so years 
is that uh, at the exact moment that all of the back-end developers I knew started figuring out how to get really good visibility into their apps, all of the front-end developers I knew were really busy doing something else, which is moving application logic from the server side into the client. Um, so this is a huge part of what I'm talking about. Like Single-page app frameworks, especially React right now, mean that people are building more and more complex browser UIs right now. And um, I think you know, even if you're not using one of these frameworks, it's very likely that your company is building its most complicated JavaScript ever right now. And uh, of course, as we move more application logic uh, you know, from the server to the client, all of a sudden we're running it in one of the kind of least monitored and, and least thought about often areas of our stack, which is our user's browser. And we kind of all know exactly what could happen there, right? Like we're obviously making more and more ways that things can go terribly wrong, and we won't even know about it. Uh, and yet, when I talk to people about their uh, alerts and their monitoring, over and over I kind of hear the same story, which is that people are so much more likely to be paged for a, a server issue that affects no one than for a browser issue that affects everyone. Um, so I think rather than wait around for this uh, Wile E. Coyote-style demise to come to us, now is the time for us to start thinking about this and fixing it. Um, Daniel Esposet, who used to be at Etsy, or is at Etsy, um, said this really well. He said, the browser is part of our distributed system. It is not just a client that we publish content to. And I think as we're pushing more and more logic to the browser, that's becoming more and more true. Um, and I think it's really important for us to all be armed with the same set of tools to take on this challenge. Um, I think it's very, very likely that if you are a person who is in this room, you are the person who's going to help the front-end developers and the web developers at your company get here. Um, I think there's incredible power to us all using the same tools together. We don't need to live in a world where the ops team uses one set of tools and the back end team has their APM thing, and then the like, front end engineers sometimes look at product analytics or sometimes don't look at anything. Um, we need to live in a world where we're all solving the same problems and using shared tools to do it, and then we can all help each other understand production systems together. Um, the corollary to all that, which you're going to love, is that uh, front-end developers can get paged now. Yes. And I think you know, putting everyone on the pager does wonders for helping us feel like we're all in it together. But not just that. It helps people write better code. Once you understand production, you actually understand the code that you wrote better. So it tightens that feedback loop. You understand the code better. You understand your users better. It's a virtuous circle. And you get paged, which is so much fun. And then finally, I think it's worth saying that we're all testing in production now. I've heard a lot of folks talk about this on the back end side of things. Um, but the same thing is happening on the, on the client side. Many browsers now roll out a new version every few months. You don't know when it's going to happen. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you're building these complex single page apps, the kind of state machine that your app can encompass gets more and more complex. You're not actually going to be able to test every set of states that the user might create as they kind of navigate through different complex flows in your app. Um, so on the flip side, this makes me really happy because I can give up that dream of fixing that giant suite of Selenium tests that were always read all the time. Like I can just accept that th this is the reality. Um, we still do unit tests and, and, and uh, just snapshot tests at Honeycomb, and they're really great. But they're just one tool in our toolbox. They're not the only thing that stands between us and our customers having a broken experience. Um, and of course, you know, the backend architecture has become more complicated. We have the same situation there. So we're all testing in production now. And I think we can all help each other get better at it. And this is a huge part of it. That's all I got. Thanks.